Dear General Petraeus, greetings and nice to see you. Likewise, thanks for the invitation. We'll start our conversation with your recent interview for U.S. media. You said that we have to convince Putin to stop the invasion and make war unsustainable for him. Is it current uh, U.S. policy towards the war in Ukraine? Uh, Western leaders just want to convince him to stop the invasion, but but they don't want to to beat him on the battlefield. Well, I can't speak for the government. Obviously, I'm not part of the government. Um, and it seems to me that the provision of now over $29 billion dollars worth of arms, ammunition, and other materiel, that's just in the security assistance and an equal amount of that probably in economic and humanitarian assistance, that that indicates far more than just some kind of stalemate. Um, my point has been to establish that what we need to do is everything we possibly can to give Ukraine everything that it can possibly employ to hasten the day when Vladimir Putin will see the war in Ukraine as unsustainable. In other words, that the losses on the battlefield are so great uh, that the war cannot continue, and also that the damage to his economy, his financial system, um, his inner circle, because of the economic, financial, and personal sanctions, and also the damage to his industries because of Western companies withdrawing from uh, Russian, and also because of export controls, that that damage is too great uh, as well. But I fear that that moment is not necessarily going to arrive in the next few months or perhaps even this year. Uh, but what we need to do, as I, as I emphasized, is to hasten the day when he sees this in that way, in the same way that, frankly, the Soviet Union came to see Afghanistan. That took 10 years, uh, far fewer casualties, though. I, I think the assessment generally is that Russia has sustained at least eight times the losses in the first year in Ukraine uh, that it sustained in nearly 10 years in Afghanistan. And of course, the losses have been uh, increasing exponentially Uh, in recent days in particular, as Russia has thrown uh, just bodies uh, at the Ukrainian defenders in the general vicinity of Bakhmut and other areas. But unfortunately, he hasn't stopped even after massive casualties, his invasion. Uh, don't you think that he's, uh, it's, it's impossible to convince him to stop the war because he's just absolutely mad? Well, there's a lot of discussion about whether he's rational or mad or what have you. I think if you look at the world and Ukraine through his eyes, uh, which of course is a, his eyes imply uh, a very twisted version of history, uh, enormous grievances, uh, an unwillingness to accept that Ukraine should exist as an independent country and all of this. If you look uh, at this with that lens, uh, then you think that he's reasonably rational. Um, that's debatable. That's an academic subject uh, that can be pursued by professors. Uh, the reality is that I think he still believes that he can outsuffer the Ukrainians, the Europeans, and the Americans in the same way that Russians historically outsuffered Uh, Napoleon's army, uh, Hitler's Nazis, and so forth. And he still is far from convinced, as you note, uh, that this war is unsustainable. And of course, the consequences for him of failure could be quite considerable. So the task is very great indeed. But again, all the more reason why the U.S., NATO countries, other Western nations all need to do all that we can. Everything that Ukraine can absorb Uh, and employ should be provided. Don't you think that it's better for international world order and rule of law uh, to have Ukraine decide the victory on the battlefield over Russian army to destroy all Russian troops rather than award Putin with a peaceful treaty and uh, uh, save his face? <laughs> Well, theoretically, yes. I, I'm just not sure what the reality of that is in terms of uh, the possibilities. Uh, but again, regardless, that we should be helping Ukraine to the greatest extent that we can uh, so that Ukraine can achieve everything that is possible. Again, you know, I 
spent 37 years in uniform, had five combat commands. I have some understanding of the difficulties of some of the military uh, options and operations that could be part of total victory, if you will. Um, and again, that's help Ukraine in every possible way. But there will come a time, I think, and I just don't know where the battlefield will be at that time, but there will come a time, I think, where Russia may recognize that this is unsustainable on the battlefield and on the home front, and we need to do more to tighten the financial, economic, and personal sanctions and export controls in that regard as well. And Ukraine will say, you know what, if there's a Marshall Plan for reconstruction, if there's an ironclad security guarantee, either in the form of NATO membership, or if that's not possible because of one or more of the NATO countries, then a U.S.-led ironclad security guarantee, and it stops the missile and rocket and drone attacks, uh, that that might be something worth negotiating. So uh, that's how I'm approaching this. Um, certainly, again, all-out victory would be wonderful. The question is, is that realistic? Can it be achieved? Uh, what would be the uh, ultimate outcome of that, et cetera, et cetera. And these are very, very tough questions. I know they're very emotional questions for the Ukrainian people above all, given all that they have suffered, all the sacrifices that they have made, the incredible determination and will uh, and innovativeness, um, all of these qualities that have been so admirable uh, and have led the world really to recognize uh, the, these extraordinary qualities and therefore to provide support uh, to the Ukrainian people and to the Ukrainian military. You know, it's just a year or so ago, I was at the Munich Security Conference. The Ukrainian president spoke, uh, foreign minister was on stage uh, with us. I was there uh, at an event. Um, I met with a large Ukrainian delegation and the question in the room at the Munich Security Conference, I think that was most significant, um, was will the Ukrainians fight? Keep in mind that we had just experienced a situation in Afghanistan where, of course, the president fled the country and his forces collapsed. Now, I felt very confident that the Ukrainian forces would fight. I'd watched them develop uh, over the course of the years since uh, 2014, really 2013. I was at the Yalta Economic Summit the last time it was in Yalta before the occupation of Crimea. And I watched the subsequent professional development. I've been to the front lines uh, in Donbass, I've been to Kharkiv, I've met with the leaders uh, after President Zelensky's election and so forth. And I felt quite confident that that would be the case. But nonetheless, we still needed to see it. And we did. By the way, I should note that I was one of the very few who said publicly in an interview in The Atlantic, our journal here in the United States, that Russia would not take Kyiv, much less uh, control it. Uh, I knew Kyiv. I knew the sprawl of the urban area. Uh, it's larger than New York City in terms of its, its, its footprint. It's half the size population wise, but a competent military can defend an urban setting like that. Uh, and do so very, very impressively. And that's what has happened. Ukraine has done all of this, and it's done it so magnificently uh, that you've seen, again, arms, ammunition, other material, and so forth, just pouring into the country, sometimes a little slower than some of us would like to see. Sometimes the decision-making um, has been a bit more tortuous than I think it needed to have been. Most recently, of course, the decision around provision of tanks but gradually it is all coming and now there's going to be a longer range precision munition uh, for the high mobility artillery rocket system uh, that will double the range of the current precision munition uh, and a variety of other additional items of enormous importance not not just tanks but also very the world's best infantry fighting vehicles uh, well now well over a million rounds of 155 millimeter howitzer ammunition that's heavy artillery um, just from the United States alone. So the, the support has been extraordinary. But look, I've been, in a way, I guess where President Zelensky is, or at least where the chief of the general staff is, I never felt like I had enough. Uh, you never have enough troops, you never have enough weapons, you never have enough nowadays drones and bandwidth and everything else. Um, and rightly, 
uh, once, you know, they say thanks for the tanks, but how about F-16s? And by the way, we should be making provisions for the ultimate transition uh, of the Ukrainian Air Force from Eastern Bloc MiGs and so forth uh, to Western Bloc, ideally F-16s. Thank you, General, for your pro-Ukrainian position. And um, in your opinion, could United States and their allies maybe try to change regime in Moscow? I think um, even discussion of that uh, is something that should be put aside candidly. This is, we've been in the regime change business before. I've fought two wars that were begun with regime change. It doesn't always turn out the way you hope it will. Uh, it's, uh, we watched what happened in the wake of the Arab Spring. Um, really, none of those uh, turned out all that well. We don't necessarily want to see the collapse of the Russian Federation uh, and all that that could entail. So I'm very hesitant to talk about regime change, much less actually trying to foment it, which is, again, um, something that could actually backfire quite spectacularly uh, and enable Vladimir Putin to rally his country around him uh, because he could make it out that the U.S., the West, whatever, is trying to topple uh, him from the throne. And again, that would be counterproductive. So again, I think that's a, a very, very sensitive topic. It's best left uh, undiscussed. Um, and again, something that I think most policymakers will draw back from, uh, rightly so. Talking about uh, Western support and weapons, as you know, Great Britain announced a program for our pilots to teach how properly use uh, Western jets. Also, today Downing Street is considering to give us long-range uh, missiles and um, modern jets, but the United States is still hesitating to provide us with modern jets and long-range missiles like Atacams. Uh, why is the United States hesitating to do it? Well, I think the reason for hesitation throughout the past year, and even before that, has always been uh, tied to the issue of whether there would be undue provocation, frankly, uh, of Russia, and whether the war a certain action might result in an expansion uh, of the war uh, beyond where it is. Um, in my view, uh, we should get on with the provision of this. Again, you're not going to just deliver F-16s anytime soon. What we need to do is start the training of pilots and perhaps even more important than that, because it, and Ukraine has more pilots, as I understand it, than it actually has aircraft, so that that's something that could be easily done without a big impact a degradation of the capabilities on the battlefield. The bigger issue actually tends to involve maintenance uh, of very sophisticated systems. This was the reluctance about the M1 Abrams tank that maintaining a 1500 horsepower jet engine surrounded by enormous armor, uh, a 70 ton vehicle and so forth is just prohibitively difficult to maintain. It's not hard to operate. I was an infantry officer. I learned how to operate. I shot the M1 tank. It's pretty straightforward. The problem is when the computer system breaks down or the thermal sites uh, go awry or uh, of all, uh, obviously the jet engine, which is very sensitive in a variety of different ways, very different from the 1500 horsepower diesel, for example, that's in the Leopard. Uh, when that goes down, if you will, when it's no longer operable, that's very, very challenging. And of course, now you have all this in a 70 ton vehicle that you can't even put on a low boy. You have to have a special recovery vehicle for it as well. These are the kinds of concerns uh, that give countries pause that have given the United States pause. Look, we gave tanks to Ukraine just to get the Germans to allow the provision of Leopard 2 tanks, not just from Germany, but also from other countries. Um, so there have been, I think these are legitimate concerns. I have sat around the Situation Room table in the West Wing of the White House, um, and I can tell you it's much easier to sit where I am right now and second guess than it is to sit around that table and make tough decisions that could have very significant consequences. And I think therefore a degree of caution uh, is not always misplaced, but I do think that we should get on with some of these key decisions. I would list actually additional air defenses for a true, true comprehensive integrated 
early warning and air defense system that includes cutting edge capabilities for, for counter drone operations. Um, certainly the provision of the Army tactical missile system, ATACMS, as you noted, which would <clears throat> double the range of what we're now providing, which is about 150 kilometers, the, the ground launch small diameter bomb, uh, and take it out to about 300 kilometers. And Ukraine would agree, I'm sure, uh, not to use that in a provocative way uh, to attack the Russian Federation targets or something like that. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to see the provision of uh, advanced drones. And there's a variety of other systems that I think could be very, very useful as well. But also what there has to be is a very significant continued commitment to help Ukraine keep everything we've provided working. And that is massively challenging. Um, there is a reference to the Ukrainian military as having a petting zoo, if is the term, um, for what it has in its uh, in its materiel, you know, it's got a few of this, it's got a few of that, it's got you know the UK, the the German, the American, still Eastern Bloc, all of this. It is very very hard to maintain numerous systems, all of which require different diagnostics sets, kits, outfits, uh, spare parts, uh, some cases fuels, etc., ammunition, caliber. Uh, whether it's rifled or not, uh, and so forth. This is very, very challenging. And I think this is going to actually prove to be more important than the next, as if you will, shiny object, the next big thing in terms of uh, precision munition or something like that, because this is going to be the heart of the offensive operations that uh, Ukraine conducts, as it has said, predicted, uh, expected, sometime in May, June uh, this summer. And the centerpiece will be the tanks, but we expect to see Ukraine do what Russia has not done, which is to combine all of the different ground forces and air support in a way that achieves what are termed combined arms effects. So you don't just have the power of tanks with the protected, the mobility of track vehicles and a, and a main gun. You also have infantry. Uh, in first line infantry fighting vehicles that are keeping the enemy infantry from using anti tank guided missiles against the tank. You have engineers and explosive ordnance personnel who are dismantling the obstacles and defusing the explosives uh, in them. You have air defense artillery keeping the enemy uh, air assets uh, off you. Ideally, you have your own rotary and fixed wing uh, close air support. You obviously have artillery and mortars of various calibers supporting you, suppressing uh, the enemy as the tanks are seeking to penetrate uh, or bypass the uh, defenses. So all of this together, including also very good command and control, uh, in communications, electronic warfare to jam the enemy's uh, systems, and even logistics, very importantly, logistics of all types, fuel, food, uh, water, uh, maintenance, uh, air, medical evacuation, all of this pushed right up behind the offensive, the attacking forces. And that's what we expect Ukraine to be able to do this summer. Uh, based on the training that's going on in a variety of NATO countries right now, and based on the equipment that is being provided to Ukraine as well. So, in your opinion, will the Biden administration go on with uh, modern jets and long-range missiles? What, what, what do you think in the future, maybe? I think at some point in the future it will. Again, inevitably, Ukraine has to transition from MiGs to Western aircraft. That's just not there's no other, no alternative. We've run out of MIGs and SU whatever to provide from Eastern European NATO members and so on. There aren't any more in the market. Uh, so that has to take place. The question is, when will it take place? What will the process be? I think, unfortunately, I saw the UK clarify what it was that was said, and they now have said that they'll train the pilots uh, post-war, I think was the term that they use. So I, I'm not sure how long this will take. Um, We'll see about the Army tactical missile system. I think perhaps understandably they will want to see how well uh, is the ground launch small diameter bomb, which will go out to 150 kilometers. That's a very significant increase uh, over the current system, the guided missile launch rocket system, which goes out to a little less than 80 kilometers, uh, both of those very precise. 
Uh, but I think there may be some other capabilities that could also be very important that are under consideration uh, and the decision for which could be forthcoming in the weeks and months ahead as well. Talking about possible escalation, do you think that uh, Russian president could use nuclear weapons of, or other weapons of mass destruction uh, in the war against Ukraine? And can such weapons, like tactical nuclear weapons, help him to achieve any success on the battlefield? I mean, he certainly could use it. I mean, again, physically it's possible that he could, uh, but the likelihood of it is very low because I think the Uh, the U.S. and other Western countries, and even some on the outside, we've all sought to convince Vladimir Putin and his leaders that use of tactical nuclear weapons would end up with Russia being in a worse situation than before they were used. Uh, our national security advisor has described what would follow such use as having catastrophic consequences. That's his quote. That's an, He's an understated uh, individual, by the way. Um, and again, others have echoed this. Uh, senior leaders have called the Kremlin uh, and cautioned against this. And perhaps most importantly, uh, it appears that President Xi and Prime Minister Modi of China and India, respectively, have also uh, cautioned Putin against such a very, very reckless uh, and what would be counterproductive decision. So I think, again, that it is unlikely It is something about which we need to remain concerned. As I said, it is possible uh, he could, but I don't think he will. Uh, do you think that uh, officials in Kremlin uh, understood uh, messages from the West about nuclear weapons? Yes. In your opinion, from a military point of view or political point of view, how would Western leaders respond exactly if Putin use tactical nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction in the war against Ukraine? Well, exactly is impossible to know because we don't know exactly what that use might consist of, how it would affect the situation, what would the level, you know, oh, there's a lot of hypotheticals here that uh, are impossible to uh, get into detail about, but again, Keep in mind what the U.S. National Security Advisor has said and what that would translate into. He has said catastrophic consequences uh, for Russia. And I suspect it would take it would be a comprehensive uh, response. It would include military elements, diplomatic elements, economic uh, elements, financial, further export controls, personal sanctions, everything uh, and make Russia an even greater pariah. Uh, state than it already is and make Putin himself uh, again an enemy of the world as well. Could it uh, include some military uh, actions um, against Russian troops in Ukraine? Yes, sure. Certainly. Um, thanks for being with us today and uh, glory to Ukraine. Indeed, Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava.